Coming up on DTNS, Gorilla Glass is tougher than ever. TikTok wants to pay creators to keep them. And who will buy arm without getting in hot water? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, July 23rd, 2020. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. And from Oakland, California, I'm Justin Robert Young. And uh, I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Before the show on GDI, we were talking about the future of sports, birds, and animals in general, and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> if you want to hear that conversation, you can get the wider one on our expanded show, Good Day Internet, by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. And let's get it started with Facebook. They expanded tests on a redesign to pages on mobile, which offers a cleaner design and easier management to owners. The redesign removes the like button, instead giving users only the option to follow and displaying a follower count. Pages themselves will focus on key information like a page's bio and posts. On the management side, the redesign makes it easier to edit access and assign roles to page managers and more easily show insight analytics directly on the page and for individual posts. On AT&T's earnings call, CEO John Stanky told analysts that HBO and HBO Max had a combined 36.6 million subscribers by the end of June. Of this, HBO Max had roughly 3 million retail customers with another 1 million activations coming through bundles and other AT&T platforms. Stanky said that getting HBO subscribers that use linear cable services signed up to HBO Max has been slow and that HBO Max users spend 70% more time in the app than HBO Now users. Corning announced that Gorilla Glass Victus, the strong one, which claims twice the scratch resistance and a 25% higher drop rating of Gorilla Glass 6, up to 2 meters. Corning also says that Victus should survive an average of 21 meter drops, up from 15 on its predecessor, so if you really want to beat it up, <laughs> Might be the right glass to have. Samsung will be the first to ship with the new glass with the device coming in the next few months. The FCC has begun Auction 105, a nationwide auction of 22,631 priority access licenses of prime spectrum in the 3.55 and 3.65 gigahertz range, letting carriers bid on seven mid-band slices per county to help their 5G rollout. The auction has been postponed from earlier this year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. You may have heard of it. The FCC requires 3.5 gigahertz licensees to share spectrum, providing immediate access to top priority government users, then to priority licensees, then allowing unlicensed CBRS users to access that same spectrum. AT&T announced on its QT earnings call that its low-band 5G network is now available to 205 million people, which now meets the FCC's definition of a nationwide network. T-Mobile has had nationwide 5G uh, networks since last December and covers over 225 million people. Verizon plans to launch its own nationwide low-band 5G network later this year. Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, you may have heard of him as well, along with 17 <laughs> other plaintiffs, filed a lawsuit against Google on Wednesday over a YouTube scam that allegedly used Wozniak's name and likeness to get viewers to send cryptocurrency for a Bitcoin giveaway event. Wow, the Bitcoin scams are really hot this, this week. Wozniak says that the scam, which also included Tesla CEO Elon Musk and Microsoft founder Bill Gates, using their likenesses as well, was ignored by Google despite repeated requests to take down the scam video. And Twitter announced that during the coordinated social engineering attack that hit the service last week, you may have heard of it, attackers were able to access the direct messages of up to 36 of the 130 targeted accounts. Twitter said this included the DMs of one elected official in the Netherlands, but that the attackers did not access the DMs of other high-profile politicians that had their accounts taken over. So, yeah, the plot thickens with the, with the Google attack, but uh, Justin, there is more to Google Stories this week. Yeah, they buried a little news on top of the, uh, the, the hack information. Probably a smart idea. In its Q2 earnings, Twitter said it saw a moderate recovery, quote unquote, in its ad business since March, with ad revenue down 23% year over year for the quarter, but slowing down 15% in the last three weeks of June. The company reported revenue of 683 million, missing analyst expectations of 707 million due in part to a 
$1.5 billion loss on a deferred tax asset. The company reported it lost $1.39 per share. Twitter saw monetizable daily active users increase 34% on the year to 186 million users, which beat analyst predictions and is the largest increase since Twitter adopted that metric. On an investor call on Thursday, however, CEO Jack Dorsey apologized for the company's recent security breach, saying it fell behind on security obligations. Dorsey also said that the company is actively exploring additional ways to make money from its users, including a potential subscription model. Earlier this month, the company posted a job opening focused on building a subscription platform codenamed Griffin. Yeah, so yeah, and we talked about this when when that job posting came up. Uh, Dorsey saying, you know, on on the call, listen, very, very early testing stages. But yes, this is something that we are actively exploring. You know, we are trying to figure out monetization options. You know, the the ad revenue dip, it, it's it's yeah, it's recovered a little bit, you know, in the last couple of weeks of June. But everybody, everybody across the board is feeling this and the monetizable daily active users increasing leads me to believe, yeah, if you can make subscribers of some of those people, then, you, you know, you, you, it may be Twitter's real only viable option to make money this year. Yeah, and I, what's interesting to me is, I mean, Twitter is not the the only social network. This is like the perennial social network problem of, hey, we have a ton of users. Um, also, we need to make money somehow. Uh, Twitter to date has done a reasonable job of doing that. I mean, they're in a good position to see that 34% increase. We were having conversations not too long ago where that number was looking flat. Uh, they have gone to this monetizable uh, daily active user metric, so that doesn't give us a total scope of that. I do wonder if that includes some sort of intelligence within that number of Hey, if we were going to do a uh, subscription service, you know, how many of those we could turn around uh, in there as well as a signal to, you know, to maybe alleviate some investor pressure as well. I think that a subscription from Twitter is smart if it is an add on to Twitter that maximizes the natural strengths of the platform. What I have thought forever is that they should be the seller of an over the top uh, a network like PlayStation View or Sling. It is what naturally people want to do on Twitter is watch and communicate and see what other people are thinking about the stuff that they are watching right now. Very often, the the trending topics on Twitter when you are not the main character on Twitter, and folks, you remember, lesson, you never want to be the main character. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> is usually about television programs, about sporting events, about big, yeah. about yeah. big events. Yeah, live so, stuff. Yeah, live stuff. If they have the ability to click through that and now I can see exactly what everybody's talking about and I can get more context to it, figure out a smart way to put in relevant tweets that are that are coming into the programming that you're watching, I think that that's, that to me is the slam dunk and the way that I would immediately give money to Twitter. Beyond that, if they're looking at an enhanced version of the product, I don't know what Twitter could do to make me want to interact with a site that I think is probably harmful to mine and everybody's mental health. Oh, that's a really good point because I think a lot of people go like, what, I subscribe and then, you know, I'm behind some sort of a paywall on Twitter and only some people can see my stuff. There, there, there are a variety of different ways that a subscription option could work for somebody, especially, yeah, if you want to make sure that your tweets are you know, I don't know, they rise to the top a little bit more rather than, you know, the the the, the ad model that Twitter's been using thus far. All right, well, speaking of social networks, TikTok, perhaps you've heard of that one, announced a new <laughs> $200 million creators fund to support U.S. creators, at least for now, just the U.S., who are, as the company says, seeking opportunities to foster a livelihood on the app. That's what a TikTok spokesperson told The Verge. This is the first time that TikTok will pay creators directly for their content. They've been letting users monetize live streams uh, beforehand, but this is this is the company saying we want to pay you to stay. The company didn't say how many creators could receive funding. They also didn't say how often payments would be made or how much creators can earn, but that they would. To apply, you must be 18 years of age or older, uh, which that's going to actually be a detriment to some TikTok creators, 
quite a few of them actually. You also have to consistently post original videos that adhere to the community guidelines of TikTok. And you also have to have a certain follower account. That's what TikTok says, although the company didn't say how many followers that meant. You know, it's kind of like YouTube saying you got to have a hundred subscribe or a thousand subscribers in order, you know, to be able to monetize certain stuff. Creators in the United States can apply for funding starting in August, and the company says it plans to offer global access at some point. Most definitely not by coincidence, though. Earlier this week, several of TikTok's biggest stars announced deals outside the platform because, you know, TikTok doesn't give creators much incentive to make money on the platform. Charlie D'Amelio, Dixie D'Amelio, all uh, announced a makeup line in partnership with Morph. Addison Ray, which is TikTok's second most followed creator after Charlie, announced a podcast exclusive to Spotify. So yeah, it sounds like TikTok is like, hmm, well, first of all, people are a little bit worried about the platform in general. The US is you know, threatening to shut it down completely. And we've got creators who are like, oh, we can make a lot of money doing stuff outside of the platform. Let's do that. And maybe we won't come back. And I think it's interesting that this is becoming a differentiator for any of these, you know, viral social media platforms, for lack of a better term on that, in that, you know, there's no end of complaints for something like YouTube um, for, you know, how they curate content, how they surface content, how they handle creators. But the pull of that monetization keeps a lot of talent on that platform. And, you know, we, we've seen, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Instagram, you know, kind of famously uh, has left monetization kind of, you know, hey, you can do your affiliate stuff and you can do your sponsored posts, um, but not kind of uh, being as aggressive on that front. Interesting to see TikTok going there. And if you need to ask how many followers you need to apply for this, you don't have enough. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly so. Uh, as you mentioned, Sarah, TikTok is currently fighting a two-front war, A, an existential fight for their very existence uh, of, on, on insistence that they are Chinese spyware, but really just as any other social media network that's fledgling, they're trying to hold on to signature talent uh, at a moment where other companies are going to offer them cash. The only thing that TikTok really, really has going for them is the fact that they are kind of unlike anything aside from maybe Instagram. And Instagram obviously utilized uh, stories and, and you know to kind of uh, take over this the Snapchat element. They put in video when Vine got big. But at the same time, TikTok is unique. The only thing that they don't have is a lot of ad real estate. And that's something where, you know, YouTube, you understand that there's a pre-roll if you want to go see somebody's video. You don't have that experience with TikTok. TikTok is something that is a lot more of a waterfall. You're just content, content, content uh, in terms of the user experience. So the idea that they are pouring money into it is smart. At the same time, it does come back to that existential crisis of like, oh, okay, so I'm very excited that my you know, I'm going to be partnering with the Chinese government to, <laughs> to take well, and you know, and you know, again, TikTok may spin off into uh, its own, you know, wholly uh, uh, owned U.S. subsidiary. That's that's the idea, anyway. So, sure, <sighs> and, and I'm not saying because Tom would, I can hear Tom yelling at me <laughs> to say that, like, let's be clear on the news program that TikTok is not owned by the Chinese government, uh, but uh, certainly the, these are the worries, and especially sure. if we're talking about younger creators. Well, let's talk about some Facebook news. Facebook's CrowdTangle reports on popular links on Facebook. Kevin Roos at the New York Times used it to rank the most popular stories on Facebook. He's been tweeting his findings, which show that conservative sources like Fox News, Ben Shapiro, and Breitbart, as well as the president, tend to be the most popular. CrowdTangle measures likes, comments, and shares on a publisher's page, not on personal news feeds. So just kind of separating those two out. Meanwhile, Facebook's John Hedgeman posted analysis that showed that if you look at reach, where which is uh, news that people actually see in their feed, whether they interact with it or not, uh, you see more liberal or nonpartisan sources like MSNBC, the LA Times, People, and Ranker.com. Hedgeman argues that reach is a reflection of what the Facebook algorithm is putting in front of people, while the engagement data used by Roos reflects user behavior. So, you know, Justin, I want to throw this to you. Uh, this this kind of cycles around uh, a lot of things you're passionate about here. News, potential portals to hell. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, how you know, reach versus, uh, I guess, um, engagement um, and news. I'm, I'm curious on your take on this. 
Since the beginning of time, Rich, uh, <laughs> there have been uh, some real kind of like medium is the message lines drawn when it comes to political content. For whatever reason, uh, certain political content flourishes on certain platforms. Television since its inception has been something that was uh, uh, very dominated by liberal sources. Uh, AM radio, on the other hand, is something that has been dominated by uh, uh, conservative sources. For whatever reason, Facebook specifically is something that is very conservative. Conservative people are on Facebook. Conservative people are liking, they are sharing, they are gathering on the Facebook platform. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of other reasons that go into why these particular sources uh, are uh, attractive to Facebook, but at the same time, Facebook does not want to be the concern, they don't want to be AM, AM radio. They don't want to be thought of as something that is only of one political ideology. And so it does not shock me that some of these other sources, liberal or nonpartisan, which is an interesting way of <laughs> phrase, because I'm sure there's a lot of people listening that would say putting nonpartisan in MSNBC or the LA Times uh, uh, in, in the same sentence is not something that they would consider accurate. But uh, still, these are our are, are situations, are, are sources that the algorithm is putting out there. And I, I would not be shocked if part of that is from Facebook's perspective saying we don't want people that loathe Breitbart or Ben Shapiro to come on and see their entire news feed dominated by Breitbart and Ben Shapiro, even if that is the, uh, 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 the real power player when it comes to like shares and uh, community interaction. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the, the platform wanting everyone to have the best time ever uh, is, you know, when you, when you look at stats like this, it's like, okay, this, and, and again, I'm not giving a face, uh, giving Facebook a pass at all, but saying there is, there's, there's some uh, fancy footwork going on behind the scenes uh, to, to figure out how this stuff does work with the algorithm that is in place. Earlier this month, Bloomberg reported that SoftBank was exploring selling some or all of its stake in the chip designer arm. Now Bloomberg reports that, according to sources, NVIDIA approached SoftBank about potentially acquiring the company. Sources says that other bidders for ARM could still emerge and SoftBank could opt out and instead take ARM public, which according to a new street research analysis, could set their value at $44 billion. ARM previously announced plans to spin off its IoT businesses to SoftBank, a move that might make them slightly easier to acquire. Sources say SoftBank approached Apple about acquiring ARM, but that Apple will not pursue a bid. Oh, a shocker <laughs> that Apple wouldn't buy ARM. Rich, you know, we were kicking this around before the show. It's like ARM is so big at this point, and so many companies use uh, ARM technology. But who can buy ARM without it becoming a serious anti-competitive issue? Yeah, it really does become that question. And, and Apple, I think, wisely, whether they wanted to own ARM's asset or not, one, they have the money to license ARM designs for as long as they want to before they eventually spin out and, you know, could, could theoretically, you know, just go wholly their own designs, you know, 10 years in the future or something like that. But when you're looking at other competitors, you know, whether it's Qualcomm, uh, Google itself, um, even uh, any any of those companies that have the assets to make a large acquisition like this, and, and again, we're talking the tens of billions of dollars for this potential acquisition, it's going to cause all sorts of regulatory concerns because they're also either makers or they profit off of the making of those chips. NVIDIA comes in in a very interesting uh, position on this because they do make some ARM-based chips uh, with their with their Tegra uh, baseline, but they don't have nearly the, the market penetration to, to shift a market like a Qualcomm or even a Google would have um, with that kind of deep integration. The thing that I think is really interesting about this is to me, if NVIDIA makes this move, and again, this is all, this sounds like it's still very early talks. To me, this is about the cloud. Um, NVIDIA has actually made uh, a, a ton of uh, acquisitions recently. Basically, in their company history, they make an acquisition like once every three, four years. Uh, in the last year, they made four um, acquisitions. One of them made very big. Uh, they acquired Mellanox for just under seven billion dollars. You should have most people should not know who Mellanox is, but they make super high-speed, low-latency interconnects uh, for things like data centers, public cloud providers. And I think that there is a market um, for, and a lot of the other acquisitions play into uh, to cloud providers as well. I think there's an argument here that when we're looking at where the, the large cloud providers are going, uh, we're talking Google, Azure, 
uh, and uh, um, Amazon. Oh, yeah, Amazon, the biggest one. Um, when you're talking about those public cloud providers, all of them uh, recently are coming out with more refined ARM-based instances, right? They are buying, that means they're going to be getting tons, they're going to be selling tons and tons on those licenses. And I think NVIDIA sees that where they're already seeing a deployment of their GPUs and a lot of their more AI-focused chips um, in, those, in those cloud data centers. I think they could see ARM maybe as the next frontier, given that x86 seems like, you know, it's kind of hit its, its performance and efficiency plateau, uh, at least on the Intel side, uh, for the time being. So I, I think this is, if they do make this move, it's a cloud play. $44 billion cloud play, though. So Yeah, I mean, it, it's at like an order of magnitude above anything else that they have done in terms of acquisition. Um, I don't know if this is going to be, uh, uh, you know, a, a weird reverse merger or something like that. I mean, SoftBank has already started cutting up um, our, yeah. or, uh, ARM to kind yeah. of divest uh, some of their stuff. So I wouldn't be surprised if maybe they they trim that down as much as possible uh, to uh, to make it to make it possible for NVIDIA. Well, moving back to some Facebook news, the company announced it's rolling out support for Messenger Rooms calls to broadcast a live stream using Facebook Live. Sounds familiar? <laughs> Working <laughs> from home, anybody? Users that create the Messenger Room can broadcast the call to their profile or a Facebook page or a Facebook group with controls for who can view the broadcast and join the call. Messenger Room live streams can ha have up to 50 participants. Now, y you know, I, I always sort of joke on the show, like... There's never a time that I need 50 participants, but there are a lot of companies that do, oh, and sure. and and a lot of you know companies that use Facebook pages and Facebook groups, and uh, you know the Facebook ecosystem in general to 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 collaborate. So this is this is you know it's it's a it's a move on Facebook's part to be like, all right, come on over to our side if you haven't already. What, what I think is the interesting play with this is that a lot of the strength of what drove Zoom to be very popular in the pandemic was the fact that only one person that was going to set up that call needed to have any kind of login, right? Or, or you could even do it, I'm pretty sure you could even do it with no with no login uh, on Zoom, or at least you could do so now. And Skype and, and you know other services kind of adopted to that. And the advantage of there, it's frictionless, right? You just click on the link, you're in the meeting. Yeah, there's Zoom bombing privacy concerns. Facebook is taking the opposite approach, but also kind of to the same purpose, right? Everyone has a Facebook account. Everyone's probably already logged in on their browser. So th that also becomes, in terms of a group call in rooms, becomes frictionless. And then throwing in that Facebook Live where for a lot of, for a lot of businesses, for a lot of groups, that they may not have a website. This is targeted at those, those people and organizations that Facebook is the internet for them. And that is a lot of people. Um, and so I, I feel like, it, it they are seeing that as an opportunity to kind of have have that same kind of impact as Zoom has while taking advantage of the fact that, hey, you're already here. This is your online presence. Let's do some webinars or something like that. And, and the song gets played. It's <laughs> <laughs> always what Facebook does. Facebook makes the knockoff product. They will get X <laughs> amount of success because if you offered a Facebook punch in the face, enough people would hit the button <laughs> that would allow the Facebook like fist to rock your jaw. Uh, but it's ultimately a fish with feathers. Like either you are going to do rooms in a way that enhances the experience of the people, how people use Facebook, or you're going to do Facebook live and have a coherent strategy around that, which already seen so many stops and starts in terms of what they want to define Facebook live video content is, is it, showing whatever you're seeing right now in a very mobile fr friendly way? Is it high end content? Is it a uh, 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 video games? Facebook just kind of wants to throw everything out there and see what sticks. And ultimately it means that very little does. So I, I, I think this is yet another Facebook product that will get X amount of adoption. And then uh, uh, sometime down the road, we're going to have a, a, a little quick hit <laughs> saying that Facebook is retiring messenger to live uh, integration. We'll all have that wonderful chuckle of, that's still a thing. Remember that? Yeah. Uh, something else I always remember is Plex. They announced the addition of 80 ad-supported live TV channels to its streaming service, available to subscribers and free users. Users can access the channels through a new section called Live TV on Plex, which shows a traditional grid guide of what's playing and what's coming up next on each channel, like you'd find, I don't know, on your cable or over your streamer. Uh, users can customize the channel listings, but cannot record the channels to a Plex media server. Plex eventually plans to integrate the channels with its existing product for recording from live TV with an antenna. 
you know, Sarah, you're a, I know you're a Plex user. Um, you know, uh, Ple yeah. Plex kind of, it, one, does this sound appealing to you? And two, is this kind of Plex maybe going after Pluto TV or something like that? Uh, it definitely is. <clears throat> Pluto TV would be the most direct competitor that would come to mind to me. I do. I run a Plex media server. That is, you know, it, it's it's how a lot of my content is, or, is organized. I've, I've done it for years. And Plex has made some really good inroads in making that experience better. This is very different than that. This is Plex saying, all right, you don't have to pay us a dollar. You just you can just watch free stuff. It's ad supported, but you can watch free stuff the way that you do with some of the other uh, cable alternatives, you know, as I like to say, mm -hmm. which they are. I, I mean, it, listen, I mean, the some of the stuff that that Plex has uh, on offer, are, you know, Reuters TV, Yahoo Finance, um, something called Cooking Panda, Drink TV. Uh, taste made. These these are networks that you tend to see on free offerings across the web. It's cool. The Bob Ross channel, by the way. Just want to shout out Bob Ross. You want to watch Bob Ross all day? You got it on Plex now. But this is very different than what Plex is kind of you know bread and butter is. And the idea that Plex is like, okay, we've we've kind of offered a live offering. If you've got an OTA antenna and there's some you know recording options that we're not going to offer on this, but just to get people into the Plex uh, again ecosystem, being like, oh, I could just watch free stuff and it's laid out real nice, and you know I I can you know play it on my Roku, my Apple TV, or you know my you know on the web or mobile kind of thing. It is um it's it's smart on Plex's part. To me, this reminds me a lot of Sling in terms of taking a hardware brand and and making a a more so, or a, a service kind of play to it. Whereas Sling was, I'm willing to pay a a leading edge price to have hardware that can give me stuff where I, I wouldn't normally get it and sort of like circumvent rules so I can have flexibility on my content. Plex is more, I want to maximize my content. I want I want to make sure that everything's uh, up here. It's a little bit more DIY. And so free content maximizes content all that much more. In fact, now it's bringing you content. I think it's smart and whatever they can make on running these channels, then good for them. Hey everybody, if you want to get the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, often hosted by Rich Straffolino. Subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Uh, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit as well. Shout out to y'all. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. All right, Rich, let's check out the mailbag. All right, Anthony says, hello from Cleveland, home of Len Peralta. Thanks, Anthony. <laughs> Yesterday's conversation about the MLB piping in crowd noise made me think of professional wrestling. Back in March, when fans were banned from attending events, one of the top companies, AEW All Elite Wrestling, started using about a dozen wrestlers from the rosters who weren't performing and put them in the audience, quote unquote, around the ring to cheer and boo. For a couple of weeks after the audience banned, but before the crowd was added, matches were performed in an eerie silence that really impacted the viewing experience. The other big name in wrestling waited over a month longer before adding in a faux crowd, and the difference in the shows was evident. It's certainly a lower tech approach to the problem, but might be a cheaper option for other athletic events. And at least in the case of AEW, this is myself, uh, Rich, talking now, uh, certainly gave Billy Gunn something to do uh, with his time, which I think was appreciated. Certainly <laughs> so. Uh, uh, oh man, I have a lot I want to say. don't think I should say it here. Uh, no. <laughs> Uh, uh, not only is this, uh, you know, the AEW example, I think, is probably the most colorful version because they allowed their performers to kind of actually just be characters in the crowd and kind of gave them a little character business, at least early on, to to differentiate, like, oh, no, this is, these aren't just bodies. These are these larger-than-life figures that are interacting in interesting ways watching the in-ring product. Uh, what I think WWE has done is a little bit more just generic bodies, just people to to cheer and people to boo and and people to just kind of be excited uh, around there. But the the advantage that those guys have is they've made their own little mini bubbles. And you know how secure is kind of uh, you can do more research on <laughs> companies, but uh, that's their idea. Whereas, you know, for MLB, they're traveling from stadium to stadium, but yet the product needs to remain consistent. So I can understand the idea of uh, uh, trying out other sounds. And I think that there are probably things, there are developments that we've yet to really see, including 
uh, uh, you know, I know that there's been a few uh, teams that have had their fans chant into their phone, and now you're actually making, you're sewing together uh, <laughs> uh, on demand, which is, I think, cool. And even, you know, live streaming, that would almost be even cooler, in my opinion. Well, speaking of cool, we want to shout out our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Dustin Campbell, Andrew Bradley, and Paolo Jacob. Also, thanks to Justin Robert Young. Uh, thanks for bringing in Dr. Bird in the pre-show. Everybody should uh, become a patron if they want that cool bird action. But what else is going on with you? Well, uh, you know, politics, politics, politics is the podcast. And uh, I'll tell you what, Friday, we had a uh, we had an interview on Friday's a a a episode. We had an interview about ranked choice voting. I know that a lot of uh, uh, DTNS listeners are are people that are you know, makers and engineers and tinkerers. And, and oftentimes when we talk about voting, uh, we think about the ways that we can do it better. Ranked choice voting often comes up. And I had a great interview with somebody who's done some research on it, not only outside of America, but also how it's worked inside of America and came up with a few unintended consequences that I think a lot of people who talk about ranked choice voting uh, might uh, not have thought about. So go ahead and check it out. It's uh, the Friday episode of Politics, Politics, Politics. Excellent. Also, Rich, you've got a new video series. Yeah, I'm doing a video series for Gestalt IT called Checksum. It's kind of a video essay series. Uh, and I recently uh, did the, actually the first episode of it was uh, looking at why NVIDIA acquired Mellanox and kind of their transformation from a graphics card company into an AI and uh, data center giant. So if you're interested kind of in more of that, uh, you can head on over to youtube.com slash Gestalt IT video and we have a link in the show notes to that specific video. Excellent. Uh, special thanks to all of our patrons. You make our show what it is. You can always support our show at any level. Dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon to know more. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Tom Merritt's back tomorrow. We have also got Patrick Norton and Lynn Peralta. See you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Frog Pants Network. Get more shows like this at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>